It's a great pleasure to introduce Enrique Gomes. Um, thank you very much, Enrique, for stepping up at the last minute to, to give mm. us a talk. Um, so Enrique is in Oxford as a British Academy postdoc, newly arrived, very lucky for us. Um, before that, he was a PhD student of Jeremy's, writing a magisterial thesis on gauge theory. And before that, for several years, a theoretical physicist, postdoc at Perimeter, for that PhD in Nottingham, postdoc elsewhere, um, uh, working on one of the sort of pioneers of the new wave of work on shape dynamics. Um, so Enrique, thank you. Oh, thanks, Arnie, that's very gracious. Um, and mostly true. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, so first of all, I would like to apologize. As you can see, there was a change in title, not a major change. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to, to have uh, for all of us the last talk of the term. And that seemed to be the way it was going. Jeremy stepped up, but then got a little bit ill. And then I took over from Jeremy. And I decided that I, um, this is partly uh, uh, about our joint work, but I decided that I had some different ideas about how to present it. So hence the change. All right, so let's go. Uh, this is based on several articles. I don't think you should try to memorize all this, but it's uh, going to be available online if you want to. Check it out later. Um, and here's the uh, schedule for today's talk. I will have the first three acts. The first act will review Einstein's whole argument, briefly. Act two will report the revival by Erman and Norton uh, as an argument against substantivalism or the claim that space-time uh, points are objects. And Act 3 re will review replies uh, in the 1990s to Erman and Norton. Um, um, the, what would have been Act 4 will have to be left for, as an encore, uh, and that's the rebuttal to recent claims, Wetherill, Fletcher, Halverson, etc., Manchak, that facts about mathematical practice rule out the whole argument. Uh, they say it never gets started, no. But the main act is act four, and you can really see these three previous acts as kind of stage setting for that act four, which I think is the more novel uh, piece of work. Right. And what does act four say? Uh, well, there I will develop my suggestion that will come from act three, that we should adopt uh, David Lewis's counterpart theory framework for discussing the identity uh, of space-time points. This uh, counterpart theory has three merits. Uh, the first two are uh, just about the previous philosophical debates, and one is, is that it will be flexible and, who knows, maybe even useful uh, for some details of, of the physics. So uh, here, Summarize the other three merits. It yields an answer to Herman and Norton. It also helps us answer whether or not, and uh, friends. So again, I won't stress uh, how it does so very much in the stuff, but we can talk about it later. And it enables us to compare two points in non-isomorphic models. Um, I think this is the, the, the it, it, it gives you a framework for how to compare points in non-isomorphic models. Um, Right. And it will also have an application in physics, which will unfortunately have to be left for just a brief slide, but again, we can talk more about it, uh, as it provides a clear picture of uh, Vienna, not Vienna Circle, but the, the physicists in Vienna, Bruckner, and uh, I think uh, Chris is probably familiar with their work, Bruckner, Giacomini, and all counter-arguments to Penrose's motivation for gravitational collapse. So, right. Uh, the main idea of the Act 4 is that points in, in non-isomorphic models can be counterparts. And that's thanks to their similar geometric and material attributes, but they're not identical. They cannot be identical. So this will deny uh, so-called transworld identity, but it will endorse a counterparthood. And um, once we start considering uh, or comparing non-isomorphic models, uh, which to be fair, I think the, the philosophical literature tends to ignore. The focus on the philosophical literature is always 
uh, on the isomorphism, uh, isomorphic models. We will see uh, starting to arise these neat connections between counterpart theories and, uh, and counterpart theory and ideas in gauge theory. So this is uh, already presaging the, 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 the uh, denouement of the talk. Uh, given a, a model based on a manifold, the models isomorphic to it form a fiber bundle where the group, the infinite dimensional group of diffeomorphisms of that manifold uh, is the structure group. And a gauge fixing condition will be a choice of section of that infinite dimensional bundle that cross, cuts across the fibers. I'll have some nice pictures to help you visualize that. Um, and uh, each one of these sections will correspond to a counterpart relation between space-time points. Sometimes I hear, is someone trying to ask a question or is it just I'm talking too loudly and... Yeah. It's weak in the furniture, but <laughs> okay. I'm not talking too loudly. Right. So let's start with the first act, uh, Einstein 1913. I think most of you are probably familiar with this story. Yes, you're right. It is a squeak in the coat. Yeah, it's like that. So uh, <clears throat> the general covariance, or uh, for those in the know, we would call it active as opposed to passive. In terms of model solutions of the theory, uh, so given a, uh, a first model, which is M comma G comma T, M is the space-time manifold, G is the metric, T is the matter content or uh, some other tensorial content, and D uh, is the diffeomorphism that goes from M to M. Uh, then we know that M2, which is related, which relates the matter content and the metric, by the pullback of a diffeomorphism is also a solution. Uh, another thing that I think philosophical literature doesn't stress is that, yes, this is also a solution. As we know from Bellot, this we shouldn't, we should have a more precise criteria of symmetry. And it, it's not very clear whether these are all the symmetries that you would want to have. And in fact, I think this has, was only proven by Torre uh, and other people that these are all the symmetries given some precise notion of symmetry, um, dynamical symmetry. Anyways, this is just a very brief intermezzo about this. So here's the assumption. I think this assumption is uh, already in, in Jeremy's 1989 paper, called like this. It's just this Victorian furniture. So, uh, Oh. Is it? Oh, guys. <laughs> um, right. So distinct is the assumption that these the identity mappings everywhere, except in a small patch or hole, which is called the H usually. Then M2 here, this type of M2 would represent a different uh, physical possibility, right? This is, the, this is an assumption that uh, I will call distinct. Uh, given distinct, mm -hmm. it's uh, uh, the general covariance implies indeterminism, which is for most of us, uh, or for the proponents of the theory, unacceptable, uh, especially, at least intuitively, especially if the hole is very small, since then the indeterminism is even more flagrant. And uh, the resolution of this uh, uh, for Einstein himself came after November of 1915, when he developed uh, a point coincidence argument and later said space time is only a structural quality of the field. Right. So here's an easy way to visualize the, the, the problem with the whole argument. This is thanks to John Norton in the Stanford Encyclopedia page. And uh, you, can, you can just look at it naively. Here, the, 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 the canvas here provides a fixed kind of background space time. And uh, the two models here represent different uh, distributions of spatial temporal relations. <laughs> and these are included by the metric and the matter fields, et cetera, over a common base space time manifold. And then you transform inside the hole. And here, the galaxy that was, this was a galaxy, it no longer goes through the point E. 
uh, usually people call points of spacetime, well, physicists call points of spacetime events. And then Norton writes in, in, the, in the caption, um, does, does the galaxy go through uh, event E? So that's the question, right? So if you have these two are both solutions, they're related by a symmetry, dynamical symmetry of the theory, which I'm not to touch on. But, uh, and then the question is whether they represent the same physical possibility or not. Right, and this, this uh, argument was revived in the 1980s. So we're already at act two. Act two will be very brief. It was just gives a few minutes for the main actors to get changed in the, <laughs> in the background. So in the 1980s, uh, Stachow and Norton, they rediscovered the, the detailed history of the whole argument uh, using the, the einstein Zulek book. And in 1987, Norton and Norman uh, adapted the argument uh, so that they could rebut a popular philosophical doctrine called substantivalism. Substantivalism is the claim that space-time points are objects, right? Understood with the usual uh, Frege Quine annotation of a word. And uh, so Statue and Norton assumed that substantivalism was committed to distinct. Uh, and so the natural conclusion was that substantivalism was false because you did not want to commit yourself to distinct. But so we're already in Act Three, so we're already making good progress. Um, in this sphere, there were replies by other philosophers, including Jeremy, um, that substantivalism could and in fact should deny distinct. And uh, in fact, uh, this is also a, a brief parenthesis. Sophistication, the, the idea of sophisticated substantivalism uh, was originally intended as a derogatory term, but uh, it has been now accepted by, you know, almost uh, everyone is not derogatory. So uh, several then adopted the view, now widespread, that's called sophistication, which stipulates that two isomorphic models are or represent I'm not going to get too much into this uh, discussion about representational capacities and so on. I'm not going to get into it at all. But R represent the same physical possibility. So here, physical possibilities are said to be distinguished only qualitatively. Um, and since two isomorphic models can differ about which space-time point has which qualitative profile of field values, then sophistication needs to argue that space-time points uh, are objects nonetheless, even though the, the qualitative profiles of the space-time points differ in each, mo in each model. And uh, there are three developments about this. So the in, in this time period, the first is uh, Maudlin in 1988, called metrical essentialism. Uh, and the idea here is that for each space-time point, the geometrical, the, its geometrical properties and relations of that space-time point are essential to it. So in any possible world containing the point, it has just those attributes. And there is some trouble here. Uh, I think this was pointed out also by Jeremy in, in, in his paper, that if we say this only for the actual space-time points as, 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 as modeling does, then we have said literally nothing about models that are not as a metric with the actual cosmos. And uh, the drag-along response, which uh, was more recently, um, there was an attempt to make this, this response mandatory by Weatherall and several uh, 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 responses to that have argued whether it is or not mandatory. I, I think it's not mandatory, but I won't get into that argument too much. So the drag along responses generalize the previous idea of essentialism. Here the isomorphisms, are, they drag uh, the, the identity of the points as well um, from one model to the other. So here's how you would see this. Given two models, again, related by an isomorphism or a diffeomorphism, we rebrand the P in the model one, in the first model, as really being uh, the image. Because there's this funny thing about pullbacks going the other way that you'd like them to go. So that is D minus one. Of but uh, so you really rebrand, rebrand the, the, the points as, as the, the image under the diffeomorphism. And this implements sophistication. It's true in this way, but there, 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 this also has problems. 
The first problem is that uh, the, the drag along response will make contradictory assertions about points in a model that has an automorphism. So if you have a model M1 that has an automorphism, uh, that means that you have a, 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 a diffeomorphism here that is not the identity and yet doesn't change. Let's say if you're in vacuum, it doesn't change G at all. Um, then you, you don't have a, a, a unique uh, isomorphism from that model to any other model, right? Because, uh, and then if you, if you don't have that isomorphism be unique, drag along, let's say that any point P prime in the image of the automorphism is officially the, 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 the point in the pre-image because they are going to get identified uh, to the same points in any other model. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about this. And, and, and you could make a lot of hay about this, in particular, for example, if the model is homogeneous, because then for any, because then um, the automorphisms will in fact connect any two points of your space time. And so there's this idea that the drag along, drag -along response here would face an abysmal embarrassment, this is a term by Chris Futrick, that there are just one space time point. Of course, this is, is uh, not acceptable, and there are several responses to this as well. So here is, is, a, is a visualization of what I was saying. Here, I just put the second picture so that you could visualize what happens with the drag along. In fact, there would be no second picture because I'm rebranding the points, but you see that the galaxy has moved, the event has moved to, to, the, to also cross the, the path of the galaxy after the transformation. And the idea is if, the, 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 if there's a single isomorphism, if the, if the manifold or the metric structure is wrinkly enough, then you're fine. Then you get each point here identified to a single point here. But if, if something is, you only need one of these actually, but well, anyways, if this is homogeneous, if it's not wrinkly enough, then this won't work because you could identify any point here with any point here. So all points here with a single point here, for example. Um, right. Okay, so here we are uh, at a counterpart theory, which is the, the, the third kind of response advocated by Jeremy in a paper in 1989 and 1987 as well. Right? So the counterpart theory, as advocated by Lewis, says objects in different possible worlds are never identical. They are counterparts of each other. They're better or worse. Uh, according to how similar they are, according to some uh, idea of similarity. Of course, David Lewis was a master of foreseeing possible objections and responding to them. And there is this quite obvious objection that, uh, for example, uh, Hubert Humphrey might have won the 1960s US presidential election, uh, should be about the actual Humphrey and not some distinct or similar person. And Lewis has, uh, I've, I think, convincing uh, rebuttals to this objection. Namely that counterparts are suitable truth makers for propositions of, about possibilities for actual objects such as Humphrey. Uh, so I think the main merit of counterpart theory, which uh, will translate to our particular uh, implementation of it in this context is that uh, counterpart theory is flexible. It treats doctrines such as transworld identity more flexibly. Sorry, it is more flexible than doctrines such as transworld identity. And that's because similarity is, is vague and comes in degrees, right? And any two objects can be equally similar to a given one. And this is also important. Uh, for example, I could have been twins. So counterparts uh, theory has this way of avoiding uh, abysmal embarrassments. And this is, uh, these are the two papers by, by Jeremy in 1987 and 1989. Uh, and that's what essentially he said, space-time points uh, in different possibilities can only be counterparts. And this was another, yet another answer to the whole argument. And it, uh, uh, it prompts us to consider, and this is the motivation for uh, my this part of my own work, 
uh, consider comparing uh, space time points within non isometric space time. So, this will be act four, the, the final and most important act. Um, so, again, to uh, sear this into your mind, uh, the main purpose of this talk is to put forth a particular realization of the idea of counterparts as related to gauge fixing. Uh, and this will incorporate aspects of one and two that I highlighted previously, as well as from counterpart theory. So it will deny transfer identity and for isomorphic models, all, all kinds of counterpart relations will coincide with the drag along. And there's a third uh, element here that it's, it doesn't suffer from the objection of homogeneity, <clears throat> which we will see later. Okay, so. I think I'm doing well in time, in terms of time. <laughs> uh, right. So uh, this opening I took uh, from my pit with Jeremy. It has Jeremy written all over it. Uh, <laughs> arising from the ashes of this controversy is like a phoenix, uh, a fiber bundle. I also have some more of what Jeremy calls bad jokes <laughs> very shortly. <laughs> so, uh, so here's the idea that I very briefly glossed in the beginning of the talk. There's a bundle of space times. You're given a space time uh, M, comma G, comma T, the set of all models built by all the diffeomorphisms T on acting on the manifold will form the fiber of a principal fiber bundle with structure group diffeomorphisms of M. And so for now, I think it's, it's, it's useful to set aside T. It will just uh, encumber the notation. So we'll just think about uh, vacuum space times. Nothing here will depend on that. And uh, so we can really talk about the fibers being, uh, being iso uh, isometry classes by the diffeomorphisms. And here the base manifold is the set of orbits under the diffeomorphism. Uh, we call it Lorentzian superspace. This is nomenclature that comes from um, Hamiltonian approaches to quantum gravity. Usually people call this superspace, just a space of equivalence classes of Riemannian manifolds, but here we're calling it Lorentzian superspace. Um, right, and here is a picture uh, for you. I'll call lore of M the space of all Lorentzian metrics, right? It's the only time we're gonna use the indexes, just so again, not to encumber notation. Um, so this is the whole space, and uh, you have equivalence classes under the, the group of diffeomorphisms stands next to it, and it acts, pushing this metric up and down, and this whole orbit corresponds to an equivalence class of, of metric. And I call and I use square brackets to denote the equivalence classes of these metrics. So far, so good. Okay, <laughs> and just as an aside, th this is a very general picture that works for any theory with symmetries, including gauge theory. So it's true that um, people usually mention the difference between the symmetries of gauge theory and diffeomorphisms, that the symmetries of gauge theory you can uh, see as acting on a fiber bundle, uh, but not the, the symmetries of diffeomorphisms. But once you move to this higher interdimensional space of models, then they look exactly the same. All of them look exactly the same. Um, here's the notation. Uh, and the idea is that you can gauge fix is a section like this. The section can intersect each orbit, every orbit, if it's a perfect section, which they don't exist in, in more complicated theories, but it should intersect each orbit once and only once. Okay. And then you're gonna get one representative of each orbit uh, only one representative of each orbit of each isometry or isomorphism classes on this section. Right, um, there are two ways of seeing a, a gauge fixing section. You can see it as an embedding of the equivalence classes up into the models. So it selects one representative per equivalence class. Or you can also see it as a projection of any, uh, and I'll have a better figure for this, of any point here, it projects uh, into this gauge fixing section. So one, it lifts this, the other projects to the gauge fixing section. The, the idea is, is, is the same. Um, but 
what is the, the most convenient way of describing uh, this projection is using what's called a dressing function. It's a strange name, uh, and we're going to get to Jeremy's bad joke about this very shortly. But uh, I, I think it's due to Dirac. Um, not in this context, Dirac was dressing electrons, uh, but the, 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 the ideas are unified, actually. It's the same kind of idea. And uh, th so the addressing would take a metric and yield a diffeomorphism. It's a strange thing to contemplate, but it's the idea is you're giving some metric, and the metric is not in the uh, it's not in the section, it's not in the represent representation class that you chose. And so you need to apply diffeomorphism to it so that it will go to that section. And this is the dressing. The dressing takes a metric and gives you back what is the rotation, what is the transformation that you need to apply to it so that it will go down to the section. Um, it gets complicated, the actual formulation of the dressings. Um, and here I've given you, uh, uh, so it, it needs to, first of all, obey two, uh, two criteria, two conditions. The first is that the dressing actually, the action of the dressing of the metric actually gets you to the, the gauge fixing section. And the, and the other is that if you had started with a metric that was removed along the orbit a little bit upwards, the dressing of that second metric would just be the composition of that remove with the original dressing. These are very natural demands, though they look a little bit complicated. So here is again a figure to help visualize, uh, again, the dressing would take any metric down to the, well, the dressing will take any metric to a diffeomorphism, and the diffeomorphism will take that metric down to the section. I, here, I just put the diffeomorphism group inside to make it have, easier to visualize. You shouldn't think of it like that, but this is what the dressing does, right? It's, it's a group, diffeomorphism group that acts on the metric or on a state and gives you and puts you on the section. I know it's it's difficult to imagine that such objects exist, really. And so here's an example uh, that is the simplest example I know for Coulomb gauge in, 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 in gauge theory. Uh, in gauge theory, the group of gauge transformations are just essentially the smooth functions. Uh, can you see her? Um, and the, uh, for, for Coulomb gauge, which is defined by the divergence of the gauge potential being zero, the dressing gives you something like you take the divergence of A and then you take the, the inverse Laplacian. This is non local. And you can check, although I won't do it for you now, but that the divergence of this dressed gauge potential really is zero. In fact, it's so easy that maybe it's. Uh, so if you apply a div here and a div here, you get a Laplacian, it cancels with this Laplacian. So you get div A minus div A, which is equal to zero. And it's also very easy, this is a topic for another talk, to check that this object is itself gauge invariant, or this object is itself gauge invariant. So there's this alternative interpretation of dressed functions as relational observables that I also, this is another talk. So this is, you can see this as just a gauge invariant function itself. It's also easy to see a gauge, a gauge information is adding grad here. You add grad here, you get a Laplacian which cancels with this to so get grad of that function minus that that function cancels. Right. And um, you don't have to follow this, you just have to believe me. About this. <laughs> uh, okay. But in general, this seems complicated enough. How do we find such a section? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's not trivial. And in, indeed for, for GR, for Lorentzian metrics, there's no rigorous slice theorem which uh, says that for the Lorentzian superspace, you always find uh, these uh, little infinitesimal local sections. In the remaining case, you do have something like that. But there are uh, theorems that restrict conditions uh, enough to find such as license. Those are enough for us because I, I'm not going to, to get into the details of, of these uh, sections too much. Um, but the, 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 the the general idea is to just use regular uh, values, uh, define surfaces regular values. That's what we do with Coulomb gauge, for example. You define some function on A that goes to zero, and everything that satisfies that will form itself a surface. This is 
in differential geometry is called regular value surfaces. Um, and the way you do it is that the kernel of the function would provide a gauge fixing or would actually form the surface if and only if there exists a unique dressing for that that satisfies uh, this condition. Uh, so namely that the, the, the function that's defining the regular value does vanish when you apply the, 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 a unique dressing to the, to the state. Okay, this is, this is it's, it's technical, but the way that you actually do it is you use coordinates. And so in, in GR, there are two very well-known cases in fully covariant uh, GR, Lorentzian GR. This harmonic gauge, as you see, I'm, I've used coordinates here. The idea is that, uh, well, these refer to coordinates. This is not a covariant equation. This is the partial derivative. And to solve this, you need to find some sort of coordinates that, uh, that, that will be unique in certain sense. You, of course, start with some auxiliary coordinates, auxiliary set of coordinates, and you're trying to find a transformation to the coordinates that satisfy these things. Fermi coordinates is the same, but there you have some preferred objects, some preferred mass or something like that, that you want to identify in all isomorphic space times. This restricts, uh, sorry, in, 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 the, in a given class of space times that you're considering, there is a preferred mass. Let's say we want to think about um, counterfactuals about our sun then in all the space times that uh, we're going to think about, there is a very massive object that is like the sun, and we're going to try to fix Fermi coordinates, for example, in each space time around that sun. And then you can identify points around the sun in each one of these space times by the use of Fermi coordinates. Uh, the, the problem comes when we try to write these conditions without coordinates, uh, and then you need to invoke an auxiliary metric. And I think this, is Ollie pointed this out to me a long time ago, but I, I don't know if he remembers because it wasn't exactly this, this topic that we're discussing. And um, you, you can, in Lansman, he does it for the harmonic gauge. He talks about how uh, invoking another auxiliary metric could be just a Minkowski metric. Um, you can, you can, uh, you can, you don't need to deal with coordinates. But of course, if you're going to invoke a, a, an auxiliary coordinate, then the picture that we have, we in fact have when we construct gauge fixings, is not just a single one of those sections, but is a foliation by uh, all these sections that are parametrized by. So, so if you, once you pick one metric, you fix that. that. OK. Um, Sorry, does it mean the auxiliary metric that you pick in this second half of this slide yes, is, yes. is going to in the blue section. Yeah, it's going to be in one of the blue sections. Yes. Okay, so in a way, this procedure doesn't define a single section. It defines a. Yes, that's right. Variation. That's right. Okay. So then the, having picked an auxiliary metric G bar. That's yes. Awesome. That's right. That's right. Ah, yeah. And, and uh, Fletcher and, and Weatherall do the same thing for Fermi coordinates instead of. Opinion the coordinates, they do with everything geometrically, but then they invoke an auxiliary metric. Um, so now we start, to, now I'm going to finally get to threading. How, how are we going to relate or find counterparts between space time points belonging to different models? So here's an idea. Um, given a family of, uh, a one parameter family of non isomorphic space times with this curve here, right? Um, you can project that down to the surface. At each point, you're going to have a diffeomorphism that projects it down to that surface. Again, the dressing, right? Um, and so you're going to get a one parameter family of diffeomorphisms of them. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. Um, so this projection is a one parameter family of diffeomorphisms, and this is this parameter family of diffeomorphisms is how we thread the space times, uh, the space time points of non-isomorphic models. So here you think of each one of these points along this line here as originally being something like that, and then you apply diffeomorphisms to each one to to to, to relate to space time points. Uh, yes, can you just say what the parameter is? The one parameter. You say, yeah, you've got this one parameter family of diffeomorphisms, and I'm thinking of parameter representing the different. It's not time isomorphism class of space times. 
So each, yes. each is a fiber, but some. Yes, so if you'd like, uh, I mean, it is just a, a, a one parameter. The idea is that they're, they're non-isomorphic, is that you could write, if I were to project them, they would also form a one parameter family of, of, of equivalence classes. The one parameter family is, is let's say you, you want to deform space time in a certain way. You really want to deform, uh, you really want to physically deform space time in a given direction. This would give you a one parameter family of non isomorphic space times. If you want to continuously deform space time, I think I may have misunderstood. So, yes, but then what? So, is so I'm thinking that, that each, for each parameter, I've got a diffeomorphism that takes me from one point on the blue curve to the point on the green curve that's on the same fiber. Yes. Right. Right. So you start out, since the, the, look, all these curves are written, there is a notion of identity of the manifold M. All these curves are written as this distribution over the same space-time manifold M with the same notion of space-time. So you think of them as really being on top of each other. And then each one of these diffeomorphisms will change how this, this B, for example, here sits atop the other. And so it will change the, the, the threading, the, the, the relation of, of the points here and here and so on. Is that? And the one parameter here is just a parameter of deformation. It's not time. It's, uh, it's, it's a parameter. It's often invoked, for example, to talk about perturbations of space times and things like that. Is that? Totally convinced. So I, 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 I should start by thinking of the blue curve. It's the parameter of the blue curve. Yes, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. It could so I think that's, I was thinking of it in image and then I, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, all right, sorry. Yeah, that, that's right. By the way, this figure is not, is not my own. I took it from, uh, this paper by these Vienna people I mentioned at the beginning, Brooklyn and Jacomi, and they use a very similar similar ideas, but dressed uh, in, in, in different jargon. And I will relate briefly at the end. I'll, I'll relate to uh, yeah the, the the two types of of uh, of threading. Right. So. <clears throat> Here in words, uh, for those of you who haven't, uh, it, it's not a straightforward idea, I think, but in words, the idea is that we compare different space-times or possibilities in terms of threading together space-time points across their copies of the manifold M. And more generally, we can use sections and connections, which are infinitesimal sections, which I haven't addressed here, we can talk about it, uh, to compare different physical states by appealing to their representatives in, in the section. In short, related fibers of the bond, right? So we're relating these different uh, equivalence classes. And there, in the philosophy of physics, there are two applications or two frameworks for relating these fibers. The first is counterpart theory, and the second is about relationism, uh, best matching, which uh, it is also very interesting and it's different. Um, the ideas are, are, are are different in an interesting way. And I will also try to, to mention uh, the application to the uh, Penrose uh, collapse ideas at the end. So, okay. So now we finally get to using all this machinery to talk about counterparthood. And again, in our jargon, a choice of counterpart relation of space time points uh, uh, Specify threading, uh, sorry, yeah, for point specifies the threading of space time points across the copies of the manifold then in the different fibers for non isomorphic uh, models. And now take any curve uh, between two given metrics along the section, and the counterpart relation between the points of M at one and at N2 is just the identity, right? Because if you remember here, if this was the, the, the one parameter family of, of different morphisms was just taken to the section, if you're already on the section, uh, it's just the identity. So given any G1 and G2 along the section, 
We can define the counterpart relations without mentioning the paths between them. All the paths will give you the same uh, counterpart relation. Sorry, Mika, can I just say for clarity that yes. by identity, we don't mean we're giving up our noble Lewisian denial of trans world identity. It's going to be, as it, in a later definition, the identity of a certain group, namely the beloved Diff capital M group. It's right. the identity, I, diffeomorphism will in fact be the mathematical representative of the intuitive idea that bloody hell, slides ago you chose this section as your preferred section. So any two thesis on this section, if you've got a one parameter family of diffios that thread the points internal to those points in the massive bundle, then li live by your the words you utter, be committed to that section. So it's fine. Right. In a way, you're saying you already chose the, the, the selected class of representatives of that metric. No further rotation uh, is needed. No we further don't need with that just the identity to be suddenly becoming a Kripkean, heaven forbid. <laughs> right. Um, and so the interesting thing is that now using this counterpart relation along the section, we can then define a counter relationship between any two, any two uh, metrics, any two field states, uh, any two Lorentzian manifolds, even those that are not in the section. And we can also do that without mentioning paths. So uh, here's how we do that. Wait, so this, let me. So here's how we do that. Um, if you're given two metrics, uh, you project down one to the section, then it's just, then you go from here to here, and then you go back up by the diffeomorphism. The bad uh, Jeremy joke here was, well, he undresses, goes into the swimming pool, swims, and then dresses again. It doesn't quite work because here he's dressing and here he's undressing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The, 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 it's almost there, maybe it's on reverse. Uh, okay, so, so this, this is the idea. Here's a metric, I pick any two metrics. The counterpart relationship would be the composition of this diffeomorphism and this diffeomorphism. Um, so, oh, I'm using the wrong button. Uh, right, so each counterpart relation is natural in that it is determined by a choice of section. It encodes a similarity as roughly speaking the diffeomorphism that together with some horizontal travel along the section uh, would transform the state G into a state G prime. And for two space times that both line the section, the relation is utter similarity as uh, Jeremy said. And the, the relation is covariant in an appropriate way under the action of a single group element. Well, this we will also see what it, uh, what this, this means. Okay. So here's how the, the here's the, the technical definition. The counterpart uh, the counterpart relation between two metrics G1 and G2 is again the dressing applied to G1 composed with the inverse of the dressing applied to G2 for the same section. This is an element of the diffeomorphisms group. Sorry, yes, could you just okay. Thank you. So this has uh, several interesting properties. If we were to apply the same diffeomorphism to the two metrics, the counterpart relationship would remain the same. So if, if I lift both of them together, the or if I just lift the section, the counterpart relation between them stays the same. Uh, and so two models that lie in the same orbit will always relate by the isomorphisms that connects them. So take G2 is just uh, isomorphic to G1. The counterpart, uh, the, the counterpart relationship between them is just that diffeomorphism that relates them. So I take this, and this is independent of the section that you chose. This is the important bit. So I think to be this, this to be the grain of truth in the idea of whether all. Uh, uh, which I have rejected 
uh, we briefly rejected that the drag along response is, is, comp is compulsory, N namely that for any counterpart relationship that you chose, the, um, for isomorphic models, the, the counterpart would give you that, uh, that diffeomorphism, that drag along. I think more interesting is that the sort of counterpart to this transitive. So if you pick a point P in spacetime M1, and then its counterparts in the spacetime M2 is Q, and you pick it at another third spacetime M3, which is a counterpart whose counterpart of Q is R, then uh, the counterpart of P at M1 and would be R at M3. So you, it, it, it tracks uh, these, these counterpart relations for each choice of section. Uh, just in yes. uh, this last comment, independent of the section, I think the idea is that once you choose a section, that's right, that's right. Then, concerning three points in the total bundle G one, G two, G three, you can go through this calculation of the down, across, and up. Yes, and you'll find that you get this neat transitivity. Yes, uh, and. It, but that was for the section. Or, yes, that's right. So, it was so the counterparts the themselves will depend on the section. Yeah. But it's true that for any section, this discussion would go through. Yes. And the other thing I say, just throwing is a, we say the counterpart relation, and that makes you sound to a philosopher or logician, it sounds like, right, it's on or off, you know, it's angry or calm, or sad or happy, right? But this relation is really a measure of similarity, but not a measure in the sense of measure theory. But it's an element of this diffeomorphism group. But of course, diffeomorphism is going to be close to the identity, in which case they're small, or they can be real shifters and far from the identity. So this similarity large means close to the identity, of course, meaning G1 and G2, you know, their dressing and undressing functions are, are small differences. So, yeah. Similarity is what is really right. it could be very, very different, right? They could be arbitrarily different and self geometrically. Yes, they're but they're both close to the section, and yes. you a priori announced that this section was your beloved. Yes, <laughs> right, right, exactly. Representatives. I think this is a clarification question. So, I, I, I was thinking of it that. You know, what you want, of course, at the end is that I assume a counterpart relation among the points. So G1 and G2 is a selection of two models. Yes. And counter of G1 and G2 gives you the counterpart relation for the points, as it were. It tells you how to map one of the models into the other. Yes, because it, because that's right. Because it gives you a diffeomorphism. And once you apply the diffeomorphisms to the points of one model, they related to points of the other model. So it's not just a measure of similar, it is a counterpart relation for the points. Yes. Uh, it is, yeah. Yes. It means this threading idea, while also getting a nice group theoretic representation in it for a certain kind of nice of Right. So, yes, exactly. So by this, I hope I didn't give the impression that uh, the counterparts of point P in, in spacetime M1 uh, at spacetime M2 are independent of the section. That's not what I mean. All I meant is that the relationship is, is transitive. And it's really easy to, to see, actually. If just look at the picture because you go down here, then you go up again, and cancels, and uh, goes down again. Okay, so summing up, counterpart with of metrics according to sections of the space of Lorentzian metrics. Uh, the counterpart with is, is relative to a given section is transitive. The counterpart with between isomorphic space times is independent of the choice of section. It's canonically by drag along. And for non isometric space times, there is no unique uh, counterpart relation. The formalism, therefore, is inimical to transworld identity. Um, and uh, but if it, there's also another thing that I didn't have time to 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 address is that if if the model has non-trivial automorphisms, say a group like this, then at end the, the section would only gauge fix the quotient between the total group of diffeomorphisms and the normal subgroup of of 
of automorphisms. Um, and I'm almost done. I'm just going to now uh, talk about the, 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 the application to Penrose. I, I need to um, first be honest that I, although I have read Penrose himself, uh, I'm not an expert in, in, in Penrose's ideas. And so these are secondhand accounts that uh, come from the Giacomini and Bruckner's papers. So this, I'm sure, is true. In, this, in discussing the quantum superposition of spacetimes, Penrose constructs some counterpart relation that he feels is natural uh, between the points of the superposed spacetimes. He, he then has some argument saying that the superposition is unstable and that it will collapse into the branches of the superposition. And uh, Bruckner and Giacomini say that this uh, argument is wrong. It doesn't follow that the, 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 the branches will collapse. For they take Penrose to be in effect saying, given a superposition of microscopically distinct spacetime, each with, let's say, a freely falling particle, then uh, you can't simultaneously, simultaneously here should not be think, thought of as temporal, but you, should, you can't use the same coordinate transformation to, to make that freely falling particle, uh, to, to, to give that, to find inertial coordinates for that freely falling particle on both space times. Um, the more important consequence for Penrose is that you, because of this, there's a failure to find the same time-like k vector field in each branch, and so there is some implication for the time uncertainty relationship. Relation. And Bruckner and Giacomini, uh, they, they, their criticism of Penrose is that he does not allow quantum reference frames, meaning that frames can themselves be in superposition, and they can also be uh, rotated or altered separately in each branch. And according to them, this allowance would solve the problem. So in the language here, all that this counter argument would be saying was like, was saying, uh, yes, if you choose an initial counterpart relationship or initial section, it is true that you can't just rigidly, uh, or you can just move the section up and down and find some sought after properties like inertial coordinates in each one of these non-isomorphic space times, but you can choose a different counterpart relationship. You can choose a different section such that this property would be obtained. Uh, so this, this would be my construal of uh, Bruckner and Giacomini's counter argument. Right, so I won't have time to discuss the relational framework. Um, I will just sum up. Here, I construed counterparthood in general relativity in such a way that it uh, yields an answer to Herman and Norton. This is very much following Jeremy's original 1987 and 1989 papers. It helps us uh, answer whether all about what the grain of truth in the drag along response. And it enables us to compare two points in non isomorphic models. And I think that it provides a clear picture of Bruckner et al.'s uh, counter arguments to Penrose's motivation for gravitational collapse. Thanks very much.